Good evening. I'm Robert McNeil in New York. And I'm Jim Lara in Washington. After our summary of the news this Monday, we preview tomorrow's UN showdown with Libya over Pan Am Flight 103. There's a documentary report on the devastation of Somalia's civil war. Jeffrey Kay reports on one way to cure America's teacher shortage. And essayist M.I. Wallach talks about what AIDS has done to the arts. Bill Clinton challenged Jerry Brown to a series of debates before next week's New York primary. He issued the challenge in Wisconsin today before heading to New York. Yesterday, Clinton said he smoked marijuana once or twice while a student at Oxford University in England. Brown ignored that issue today. He appeared on Wall Street and accused Clinton of, hip of hypocrisy, saying he took money from millionaires while pretending to represent the little man. Ross Perot took another step toward running for president today. He named retired Admiral James Stockdale as his temporary vice presidential running mate. Stockdale was a Navy pilot in Vietnam who was shot down and spent nearly eight years as a prisoner of war. Twenty-eight states require an independent presidential candidate to name a running mate. Perot said Stockdale has agreed to let his name be used until a permanent vice presidential candidate is chosen. Rulers in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia today ordered supporters of the ousted president to lay down their arms by midnight. The order came after four towns in western Georgia were seized by forces loyal to the former president, Zviad Gamsakordia. Government troops began moving into the region to enforce the ultimatum. The ruling state council warned there would be no negotiations with the Gamsakordia supporters. The United States has invited Arab and Israeli negotiators to a fifth round of peace talks. The invitation is for Washington on April 27th. It requires both sides to pick a location outside the United States for the sixth round of talks, or Secretary of State Baker will choose it for them. Israeli negotiators have said they want the talks moved to the Middle East. The U.N. Security Council today postponed a vote on whether to impose sanctions on Libya for not handing over two suspects in the 1988 bombing of Pan Am 103. Today's delay was due to a Muslim holy day. The vote is expected tomorrow. We'll have more on this story right after the news summary. That's our news summary. Now it's on to the U.N. and sanctions on Libya. Somalia's civil war. A Peace Corps for Teachers in America. And an essay on art and AIDS. Another face down with Libya is our lead story tonight. The United Nations Security Council is expected to vote tomorrow to impose sanctions on the government of Colonel Gaddafi. The United States, Britain and France want Gaddafi to hand over two men suspected of bombing Pan Am 103. So far, he has refused. Our coverage begins with a backgrounder by Judy Woodruff. On December 22, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103, en route from London to New York, exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. Some 270 people, most of them Americans, were killed. Once it was confirmed that a bomb brought down the aircraft, suspicions first pointed to Iran, possibly working with Syria as the culprit. Their motive was believed to be revenge for the downing of a civilian Iranian Airbus by the U.S. Navy in July 1988. The U.S. and foreign governments launched a massive investigation that took three years of piecing together physical evidence and intelligence about terrorist organizations. Last November, the U.S. Justice Department and its British counterpart said their evidence led them to indict two Libyans for the crime. We charge that two Libyan officials acting as operatives of the Libyan Intelligence Service, along with other co-conspirators, planted and detonated the bomb that destroyed Pan Am Flight 103. The two Lockerbie suspects, Abd al basit Magrahi and Laman Khalifa Fahima, officially are Libyan airline agents. But the U.S. government said that they are high-level Libyan intelligence operatives involved in international terrorism and demanded that they be turned over directly to the U.S. or to U.K. authorities. Libya's leader, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, immediately denied the U.S. charge and refused to extradite the two suspects. 
the Lockerbie indictments were the latest point of contention between the United States and Libya. In 1986, President Reagan ordered a military strike on the Libyan capital of Tripoli in retaliation for the bombing of a Berlin discotheque popular with American soldiers, an attack for which the United States blamed Libya. Libya said dozens were killed in the U.S. attack, including a daughter of Gaddafi. In the years after, Gaddafi had been relatively quiet, even during the U.S.-led war against Iraq. But he has grown more vocal since November. He charged the United States was planning another military attack on his country. In January, the U.N. Security Council ordered Libya to extradite the two Lockerbie suspects to the U.S. or to Britain for trial. In a last-ditch effort to prevent or delay sanctions, Libya last week said it would turn over the two suspects, but to the Arab League. The Bush administration dismissed the offer. History would suggest that we should be skeptical that this is indeed a good faith offer. We suspect that Libya is once again trying to find another way to buy time and avoid complying with its obligations to the international community. When Arab League delegates visited Tripoli late last week, they left empty-handed. At the UN, the US, Britain and France are pushing for a unanimous Security Council vote. The resolution calls for all nations to stop flights into Libya and to stop shipments there of aircraft and small parts. It also calls for an arms embargo and says all countries should significantly reduce their diplomatic staffs in Libya and curtail Libyan diplomats in their countries. The vote had been expected today, but was postponed probably until tomorrow for procedural reasons. Now, three views on tomorrow's vote to impose sanctions on Libya. Josh Friedman is a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter who covers the UN for New York Newsday. Lisa Anderson is a professor of comparative politics and director of the Middle East Institute at Columbia University. Henry Schuller is a Libya expert at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Josh Friedman, uh, is the vote going to happen tomorrow, as far as you know? About 99 percent, sure. Yeah. And is there any doubt that it will pass? None at all. And how will it be unanimous? There'll probably be four to five abstentions. Uh, Cap Verde is, is uh, vacillating, but I think China, uh, India, uh, Morocco, and um, Zimbabwe will abstain. How real was the threat that China, as one of the other permanent members of the Security Council, might veto this? There were, I read stories to the effect that the U.S. was putting some private pressure on China to, uh, you know, that it might withdraw the most favored nation trade status that was recently voted by the Congress. I asked the Chinese ambassador about that today, and he denied, A, that he had been pressured, and B, he pointed out, and I've noticed this over the years, they're very loath to veto anything. Mm -hmm. He said they oppose sanctions, but I, it's very rare that they veto anything. I see. Lisa Anderson, will those sanctions that we just heard Judy describe force Gaddafi to extradite the two men? No, I don't think so. I mean, he has um, no intention of caving in his own estimation to pressure like that. I think he'd be willing to negotiate their delivery, but he's not going to be pressured into it. Henry Schuller, do you agree with that? It won't force him to give up the two men? I think there is not and never has been any prospect of his uh, extraditing the two charged Libyans for trial in a real court. We'll come back to that aspect of it in a moment. I just want to discuss the sanctions for a moment. What effect will those sanctions, Lisa Anderson, have on Libya? Well, probably fairly minor. Um, I mean, it's worth keeping in mind that the most important thing, which is oil, is not a part of the sanctions. Because that's, that's Libya's biggest export. export and, exactly. Yeah. And that's intentional because nobody would have gone along with that as an aspect of it. So, And oil is, doesn't go by air, and so the air embargo and so forth is not going to affect the, the sort of lifeblood of the country. Um, arms embargoes are notoriously poorly enforced and so I don't think we really have to worry about that. Gaddafi gets most of his important arms and so forth in the black market anyway at this point with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I don't think it's going to have that much effect. It does tighten the screws but you know the country's learned to live with that a long time ago. What effect uh, Henry Schuller on Libya? 
th have, these sanctions? Have virtually no impact at all. They are totally misdirected because they will hit the Libyan people. The poor fellow who wants to go to Rome for medical treatment won't be able to fly there. It won't impact upon Gaddafi, who can uh, fly in his G2, or he can drive to uh, Tunis and, and fly from there. So it'll have no impact uh, on the regime, which is where the pressure should be focused. And that's why the only meaningful uh, sanction would be a boycott and, if necessary, a naval blockade of Libyan oil exports. Josh Friedman, if the U.S. and Britain in particular, but also with France, are so determined to pursue this in the Security Council, why not tougher sanctions? Why not a full blockade or an oil embargo? Or... Well, first of all, I think the real intent is symbolic and not practical. Uh, they have certain political uh, considerations in the Middle East. There's a feeling as expressed by the Arab diplomats, that the Arab man in the street is very angry that Arabs are being picked on, first Iraq, now Libya. I would like to differ with the characterization of it not having any effect, though. I think it has a big but unnoticed effect because it sets a precedent, re, uh, starting with what happened in Iraq, uh, to send inspection teams and uh, uh, UN verification people into Libya to see if it's complying with the uh, a, a concrete demonstration that they will stop supporting terrorism. Before the uh, Persian Gulf War, this would have been unheard of, the idea of sending UN people inside a country. And uh, it's going to be a long time before uh, Libya can get rid of this embargo. What, what do you mean by that, a long time before they can get rid of it? Well, they have, you know, it's hard to prove a negative. They have to prove that they're not supporting terrorism, which means uh, the U.S., for instance, believes that they have some camps, five camps or seven camps, where they train Carlos and so on. Uh, how do you prove that the camp doesn't exist? People will go to the camp and say, hey, this was the camp, you've moved it to a suburb of Tripoli, and there'll be it. Uh, this can go on for years. It will allow uh, teams with a U.S. component to come through uh, Libya, which uh, opens them up to scrutiny that they didn't have before. Do you agree with that? The, the precedent is very important that the U.N. is, the Security Council is about to take? Oh, I think it is. And one of the things from the perspective of the Arab world that I think the, Lib the Arab man in the street and the Arab regimes are very concerned about is that as with the Gulf War, this constitutes a violation of sovereignty in the estimation of the countries of the Arab world. Um, and it is very hard to meet these Which demands. is the case that Libya has taken to the international court in The Hague, which I gather from reports today isn't likely to rule for weeks or months in the quite a long time, exactly. But but as with Iraq, all of these inspection teams and so forth do constitute at least potentially um, infringements on sovereignty of these countries, and that's one of the reasons why there is sympathy for the Libyan cause. But isn't this, uh, Henry Schuller, one of the things that Americans, as one of the founders of the UN, would applaud, that the UN is finally moving to enforce its edicts, which like which the old League of Nations failed because it never did. Isn't this a positive development in the, in the broader sense? Well, let me, let me uh, say that uh, everything that has been said about uh, why there should be a reluctance to take on Gaddafi was, you could have said in Spain uh, with respect to Saddam Hussein. But nonetheless, the uh, administration provided the lead uh, uh, expressed the moral outrage uh, that permitted a boycott of four and a half million barrels a day of Iraqi and Kuwaiti oil at a time when oil prices were rising. Why they do not provide the same leadership and the, the uh, same steely tone uh, to boycott less than a third of that amount of oil from Libya uh, is very difficult to understand. Is there greater sympathy, greater interest in protecting the Emir of Kuwait's throne than protecting American citizens and the right to travel safely? How do I can't you explain, believe that's the signal. How do you explain that to yourself? What is your answer to that question? Well, I'm afraid that probably oil interests uh, play a role in that. I think there is also uh, a great hope on the part of the administration that this whole issue will simply disappear. After all, uh, we were told from April 1986 on that uh, Gaddafi had been intimidated and successfully stopped terrorism. Uh, on the day that the indictments were passed on the Pan Am bombers, the State Department issued a uh, white paper that demonstrated that starting the day after the raid, 
there was, in fact, uh, a great deal of Libyan terrorism. The day after the raid that President Reagan organized and uh, ordered against Libya. Yes, Raman, in, in April of 1986, that there was continuing terrorism. Well, why was there this massive cover-up of that terrorism? And if that cover-up had not existed, uh, would perhaps the Maltese have... Uh, uh, been more cautious with respect to taking unaccompanied bags on board? Would Pan Am have had greater security measures? I think these are legitimate questions, and I don't think that uh, the administration, because then Vice President Bush chaired the President's task force on counterterrorism, and I don't think he wants to face that issue as the election approaches. So I, he thinks, he hopes it'll go away. Do you have any comment on that point of view? I'm very suspicious of this indictment. I, I don't want to seem uh, to uh, be a disbeliever in the veracity of the Justice Department, but covering the United Nations for the last few years, it's been sort of like 1984. Last year's enemy is this year's ally, next year's ally will be... Orwell's 1984. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, what happened to Syria, what happened to Ahmed Jabril, it, it's all, uh, you know, it's like smoke and mirrors, so the, I, I'm a little confused. Well, there were suspicions raised at the time of the indictments that uh, this was for some uh, political motivation in the wake of the uh, Gulf War. Are those, are those suspicions alive in your mind that, uh, that somehow uh, Syria and Iran, which had been suspected of complicity in the Pan Am bombing, have been uh, dis uh, exonerated for political reasons? I, those suspicions can't help but continue to be alive. I mean, it's quite clear the two people could not have done this and that therefore either there is greater depth in this operation in Libya or more likely throughout the sort of underworld of um, sort of terrorist operations. How good, how strong does the community of you experts on the Middle East believe the case is against those two men? I think we think it's fairly weak. Um, and in fact, some people believe that one of the reasons why Gaddafi was even prepared to entertain the possibility of some kind of trial is that he thinks the case is pretty weak. Um, at least it's likely to implicate Syrians and Iranians, which would be all right with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Henry Schiller, how strong do you think the case is? Well, I can only accept what our government says uh, in this respect, and I have learned over the years uh, not to accept what they say about uh, Libya one way or another. However, I think that the physical evidence points to the fact that these two Libyans executed the bombing of Pan Am 103. Now, I don't think they did it without the full support of uh, uh, Gaddafi himself. Things like that don't happen without that. I also don't know whether Iran and, and Syria and Ahmed Jabril were involved in it. They may very well have been, but you, as in any police case, you go after the people that you have the physical evidence on, and then if you can uh, get a, a wider conspiracy theory, you proceed to that. But I think we've got to start by, by going where the physical evidence points, and I have little doubt that that uh, points to Libya. In the uh, United Nations circles, which you cover, is there a feeling that the U.S. and Britain have got a good case against those two men? I think they feel that, yeah, there's a good case against those two, but there's a lot of skepticism that that's the whole case. I think the feeling is that uh, the U.S. would like to execute a sort of uh, plea bargain situation with them as you see with political corruption cases here, and that the reason uh, Qaddafi is afraid to allow them to be extradited is that the case would then be built against him. And uh, the, uh, one high-ranking diplomat told me today that he felt that, he's, that Qaddafi is under pressure from other countries like Syria not to uh, let these uh, two men be extradited. Mm -hmm. What uh, do you see as... Qaddafi at first was adamant and denounced the indictments and said they were being made a scapegoat and all sorts of things. But recently, he's been maneuvering a little bit, hasn't he? How do you read his recent movements? Well, I think... They're going he, to the Arab League, for instance. Then. I think he's, he's testing the waters in a negotiation. He doesn't know how far the United States is actually providing an ultimatum or this is a negotiating position on our part and therefore he's prepared to see what kind of room for maneuver there is. Um, he would, and he said so repeatedly, like to improve relations with Britain and the United States. Perhaps there's an opportunity in here to do that. Um, and so I think part of this maneuvering is in fact exactly that and he is I think becoming convinced that he's being put in essentially the same position that Saddam Hussein was 
put in. That is an abject surrender or nothing. Henry Schiller, how do you read what he's doing? I think he's stalling for time as he has successfully stalled for time for 23 years. And he doesn't know exactly what will come along to let him off the hook, but something always has. And I think the proof of that is that these indictments uh, were ready to come down or the Justice Department was ready to go to a grand jury in the summer of 1990. Because of Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, they deliberately delayed going for an indictment because it would simply rile up the Arab world at a time they were trying to put together a, a, uh, an Arab coalition. So I think that he has already wiggled off the hook uh, for a, a, an additional year that he couldn't expect. And he doesn't know how it's going to happen, but he knows that every time he's been able to stall, he has once again wiggled off the hook. And ultimately, he must be held responsible for the bombing of Pan Am 103. And the only way justice can be done in this case is not by extraditing a couple of individuals, but by, in fact, sending an unequivocal signal we to the Libyan people that there will be no basis for sound commercial and diplomatic relationships with the United States until they deal with Gaddafi. Okay. I, I take your point. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Henry Schuler, Josh Friedman, Lisa Anderson, thank you. Still to come on the news hour tonight, death in Somalia, a Peace Corps for teachers, and the impact of AIDS on the arts. We go now to another part of Africa where the United Nations is having a much harder time working its will. In the East African country of Somalia, a land of six million people, there's been a civil war going on for more than a year. The UN tried to arrange a ceasefire recently, but it collapsed. Special correspondent Edward Jaraday reports on the war and the suffering it has brought. Somalia, an impoverished arid country largely populated by nomads and farmers. Once colonized by the Italians and British, Somalia later became a strategic pawn in the superpower struggle for the Horn of Africa. For the past four months, renewed civil war has raged in and around Somalia's devastated capital, Mogadishu, a city split in the north and south by the fighting. Sometimes heavy, sometimes sporadic, it is a meaningless, horrific conflict. Most of the fighters are an undisciplined lot and no more than bandits. Many are stoned on cut, a local narcotic. This uncontrolled fighting has become a grotesque and murderous game. A game relentlessly manipulated by Somalia's feuding warlords, clans and profiteers. I asked Patrick Vercommon with a French médecin sans frontières whether Somalia is much different from other war situations. For myself, it's quite uh, different, yes, indeed. Uh, I think it's the worst thing I have uh, ever seen in, uh, in all the, the, the different missions I've been. And most of the people say it's so also. It's really uh, something, when you arrive, you're really shocked by, by what you see. Uh, because I think what's, what's really shocking is to, to see the children and the women arriving totally uh, destroyed by shells or mortars and also you can see the, the devast devastating effect of uh, those uh, automatic uh, war, war weapons and that's, that's really, uh, really shocked because I think it's one of the only places where a war like this is happening in the town and uh, where the, the, the background is in fact the, the Somali population. We travel through the ruins of once beautiful Mogadishu's old town, an area this reporter knew well from before the war. Well, we're now driving through the northern section of Mogadishu down toward the port area, which has been very badly hit uh, during the fighting and is still being hit by shelling. Uh, the other side, the other forces are perhaps I don't know, three, four hundred yards away to the right. We're going through this area, which includes a lot of the former embassies, uh, various cultural centers, various offices. Both on my left and on the right, there are numerous buildings that have been very badly damaged by the shelling. <laughs> 
these main squares where we can also find occasionally bodies lying, skeletons lying on the ground. More than half a million Somalis used to live in Mogadishu, but with the strife, tens of thousands fled to surrounding areas to escape the killing and looting. At the same time, thousands of people from the countryside, many of them nomads, flocked into the capital. They now live where they can, on the outskirts or in the streets. Since the beginning of the year, United Nations Special Representative James Jonah has sought to bring an end to this bitter conflict. For the Somalis demonstrating against the war, the chaos has wrought more destruction than the fighting which preceded the overthrow of former dictator Siad Barre. Very much part of a feudal struggle for power and money, the two rival warlords, including interim president Ali Mahdi, recently signed separate ceasefires. Ali Mahdi favors UN intervention to end the country's lawlessness. But for opponent General Mohammed Aidid, whose supporters control the southern portion of the capital, there is little to gain from a diplomatic solution. Seeking military victory, he is unwilling to accept more than a small and largely symbolic UN monitoring force. Since fighting broke out last November, the two sides have continuously shelled civilian populations. But both Aidid and Ali Mahdi deny that their forces fire indiscriminately on non-military targets, such as these victims. This is one of the 22 clinics in the northern part of Mogadishu, receiving very little aid from the outside because of the war situation. This afternoon, a number of shells fell in the marketplace, killing 10 people immediately and wounding about 50 to 60 people. 20 or 25 were brought here to this clinic, and the doctors are now treating them in the hospital behind me without anesthetics. Very little medical aid is brought in, and this is the sort of situation they are now facing here in the northern part of Mogadishu. The Somali volunteer medical teams are often overwhelmed by sheer numbers and the lack of medicine. Orthopedic specialist Steve Hennaby of America's International Medical Corps. We are highly limited in the number of things we can do. Uh, we treat most of the patients on, on the floor. Uh, we treat many patients just very briefly because we, there's many things we just can't do because of no supplies, no equipment, or no people. Almost all the head injuries, uh, we have no facilities or people to treat them, so uh, they're given some basic medications and either live or die. Uh, there's nothing we can do for head injuries. Massive chest injuries, there's virtually nothing we can do except a chest tube. Uh, the orthopedic injuries, uh, major life-saving surgery isn't really available. We're going not only back to the basics of surgery, we're going back to probably Civil War, United States Civil War surgery, where it's, uh, with the exception that we have antibiotics, but otherwise a lot of our surgery is uh, just put it as close back together and you hope for the best. Operating under extremely dangerous conditions, a few independent agencies such as IMC, Médecins Sans Frontières, Save the Children, and the Red Cross have been desperately trying to help these civilians. I asked Red Cross nutritionist Ariane Curdy how people are surviving. Oh, that's a good question. It's very difficult to answer. Looking at the market prices, you cannot imagine actually how the people are doing it. Also, uh, led to a reduced import of food to an agriculture situation got completely rotten, inducing a very poor food situation in, in Somalia, meaning that you can find food on the market but to, to very, very uh, high prices and most of the people in Somalia are not able really to buy the daily food anymore. Without jobs or money, many Somalis simply cannot afford to eat. The lack of water is also a severe problem. To ease the shortage, the Red Cross distributes fuel to help run water pumps. Relief organizations such as UNICEF warn that unless large-scale shipments of food, medicines and other supplies are brought in, an estimated 4.5 million people may soon be affected by severe shortages. Acute malnutrition is already taking its toll on children.
Somali volunteer physician Dr. Hauer feels that without an end to the fighting, the country could face an Ethiopian scale famine. These uh, poor people, they are starving, so they don't need work. They need peace, they need food, they need medicine and shelter. Yes, they don't need this work. And also we, we don't like this. The United Nations has come under heavy criticism for its poor record in Somalia. Last September, it pulled out following several violent incidents, while the independent relief agencies stayed behind. UNICEF eventually returned against the wishes of other UN organizations. War or no war, it was felt, the UN should be present. For the moment, the United Nations and other agencies must rely on a limited and expensive airlift. Sufficient supplies, however, can only be brought in by sea. But because of continued fighting, the port of Mogadishu remains inaccessible. UNICEF's Peter McDermott. There'll be seven planes, one a day, for the next seven days, trying to bring in over 250 tons of uh, essential medical supplies to Mogadishu South. And at the same time, there's another plane unloading on Mogadishu North. The emergency requires a uh, a, a, a huge international relief effort and the NGOs have been doing marvelous work over the last few months but the needs now are so so huge that the United Nations is beginning to gear up its logistic capacity to increase the, the amount of supplies in Mogadishu. We really feel that the situation in Mogadishu now is at such a crisis point that uh, irrespective of the negotiations we have to try and attempt to bring in as many supplies as we can given the very serious security constraints that exist but such humanitarian operations are still conducted at risk. Even if the UN is able to dispatch a peacekeeping force to monitor the ceasefire, it will not necessarily be able to stop the fighting and guarantee security. Even with an effective ceasefire, a major problem remains. What to do about all the guns? A massive arsenal provided over the years by the United States, the Soviet Union and other outside powers. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, an estimated 30,000 men, women and children have been killed or injured in recent months, many of them the victims of indiscriminate wanton violence. Relief agencies are now exploring the possibilities of a large-scale Food for Guns program in order to reduce the number of firearms in the country. For all too many Somalis, killing for survival, or simply for power, has become a way of life.